Greetings to everyone. Uh, welcome to our study group. Uh, tonight's topic, we're going to be studying um, personal and collective unconscious. And without any further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Anae. Anae, over to you. Hello, everyone. So uh, today we have a very interesting topic. <clears throat> And remember, uh, after in our um, you know discussion, that I made you three questions, or I proposed actually, um, so that we could um, you know think together. And I would just start with the previous um, some previous material. Let me just share the screen with you. Uh, Fabrice, it says that host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, let me just enable that one second. Okay. okay. Yep. I think it's enabled now. Okay, let me see. So... Is it on the screen? Yes, it is. Okay. So we are looking at the structure and dynamics of the psyche. And uh, one very important part is the personal and collective unconscious. Because as everybody knows, the personal unconscious was explored by Freud and followers. And the collective unconscious is a concept, is a Jungian concept, okay? And so it's very much in the culture nowadays, uh, but it's really interesting and challenging for us to go deeper. So just to uh, to remind about uh, remind us all about last uh, class. But uh, we saw a little bit of uh, what R Jung wrote in his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. And I asked you to think about, so people who will be watching us later on maybe can send some uh, questions or uh, some thoughts in the WhatsApp group if they would like. Uh, but I asked you to, um, to think about what Jung is saying that it's the first sentence in his autobiography. So it's the opening sentence. My life is a story of the self-realization of the unconscious. And look at what he says. Everything in the unconscious seeks outward manifestation. And the personality too desires to evolve out of its unconscious conditions and to experience itself as a whole. So he's kind of saying the purpose of uh, you know our um, our <laughs> psychic existence, if we could say. So it is a very challenging sentence that people usually go very fast through it, you know, reading it, but don't really pay attention. And I would like you all to keep this in mind. The unconscious wants, you know, to, to seek outward manifestation. What does Jung mean with that? And the personality, too, wants to evolve out of its unconscious conditions. You know, what would that mean? And also, he talks here, he goes on talking what we are to our inward vision. So we have an inward vision. And what man appears to be, subspecie eternitatis in Latin, under the form of eternity. So in a immortal sense, in a timeless uh, sense. So what man appears to be and what we are to our inward vision can only be expressed by way of myth. So we are going to be talking a little bit more about this, about myth. So myth is more individual, Jung says, and expresses life more precisely 
uh, then the science. Well, the science would go, uh, scientists would go <laughs> mad with this sentence. Why does myth is more individual and expresses life more precisely than the science? He says that science work, uh, works with concepts of averages, which are far too general to, to do justice to the subjective variety of an individual life. Okay, so we have all of us a subjective variety and we can grasp it. We can put in an average, you know, in a graphic. So why is all that? And okay, he's saying so that he's going to talk about his personal myth. So all of us have a personal myth. And he says that I can only make direct statements, only tell stories. Whether or not the stories are true is not the problem. So today, as I was um, telling you last class, uh, fake news, this and that. So why does Jung uh, say uh, whether or not the stories are true is not the problem? He, he goes on saying the only question that matters, right? is whether what I tell is my fable, my truth. So he's talking about personal myth, our um, personal truth, the self-realization of the unconscious and the unconscious uh, seeking outward manifestation, inner vision, lots of things to think about. And just uh, to remind us all, so he said, um, so in the model thought by Jung, the psyche would be composed of several concentric spheres. This is one general um, way of thinking, like an onion, okay? And the most, most superficial layer would represent consciousness, while the other scales would be the deepest levels of the unconscious, until you would reach the center among all these layers, there would be a constant interaction. So this is the graphic that I uh, showed you uh, last class, the unconscious in yellow, and then the personal unconscious in gray, and in red, the collective unconscious. I told you this was not a very good, it's a good to think of the onion, okay? But, See, the collective unconscious, I, I brought another image today because the collective unconscious seems so small and consciousness looks so big, right? It's not like this at all. We are going to see. It's just because of the onion that I left this one. So I found this in the Google images that I think it's, um, I think Lionel, it's not here today. He couldn't make today. He's giving class. But he has a very nice when he uh, when he talked to you uh, when he uh, he will be giving some classes and he will talk to you about uh, some of the ways he thought about the transpersonal uh, dimension of the psyche that we call is another way to call the collective unconscious. Okay, and he talks about the ocean, the waves, but I will leave that to him. And I found this image that I think it's very um, it's very nice. So we have icebergs, let's see. Let's not think of the Titanic and not sink everybody together. <laughs> Today, Sunday, we want to float, okay, in the Jung concepts. But uh, let's think of um, each one of us being like icebergs, okay, in, the, in this ocean. So... Um, the top of the iceberg, okay, above the surface, would be the personal consciousness, okay, our personal consciousness. And uh, in the water level here would be the uh, barrier, let's say, of repression, okay, that we are going to be studying uh, the um, ego mechanisms of defense and things like that. So below the... Uh, you know, the surface would be the personal unconscious, okay? Oops, sorry, let's go back. 
So it would be the personal unconscious. Each one of us have. And, um, you know, you see the personal conscious, it's much, much smaller. So I think it's a nicer way to, uh, met a nice metaphor, a way that we can think of these different uh, dimensions of consciousness and the unconscious. So the personal unconscious would be uh would be um, below the surface okay of the water and we don't know the size of each iceberg okay uh, of each person's personal unconscious but what we do know is that we all have it we all have our personal experiences thoughts feelings and that we are in the same ocean. So the collective unconscious, or as we call the transpersonal dimension of the psyche, is in depth that we cannot tell, we cannot measure, okay? And everything is connected. So our personal unconscious is connected to the collective unconscious, actually, this um, way to to divide uh, consciousness and the unconscious is just uh, for us to think, because actually it's all like quantic or it's all information. We cannot say, "Oh, here I'm talking to you, and my ego is here, and I can feel my personal unconscious." or I know everything that it's uh, repressed or uh, hasn't yet come to my consciousness. And, um, uh, oh, we are feeling everything together in this moment because we have, no, we don't have, uh, we can't reach exactly this depth with our conscious mind um, in the moment that we want. And we have to really and we are going to be talking about this when we talk about the ego. So we have to really make efforts to, you know, to try to make this contact. Let's see why, okay? And as we uh, saw last class, uh, Jung says that consciousness is a surface or sheath covering the vast unconscious area, the extent of which is unknown. So we don't know the size of our own iceberg uh, under the surf surface of the water. And so we have the, um, an image of wholeness due to the very limitation of consciousness. And uh, he says that the, um, it's difficult for us. So the area of the unconscious is immense and continuous. And the area of consciousness is a restricted field of momentary vision. So the unconscious is immense and continuous. But consciousness, as we saw previously, it's very difficult to grasp because we don't have this, um, uh, this continuation. You know, we don't have this, we don't feel as a, as a whole. I'm just going to try to put this, okay. So the personality as a whole is a whole, but we don't, you know, we, we don't have this, all this memory, the, the continuation of all our experience, memories. It's not in, we can't grasp, it's not everything there. So the world consciousness comes from the Latin, we saw this already, conscious, uh, which means to know with others, to participate in knowledge. That's why it's so important, our um, being together, having experiences together, sharing experiences. Uh, and later, uh, it was uh, it, the meaning was just to know. So consciousness is the only part of the psyche known directly by the individual forming from the unconscious. You saw the top of the iceberg comes from the whole iceberg. 
It appears early in life, probably before birth and changes throughout life. So I saw, uh, I got this image. Mm, I thought I got, I had uh, got rid of this um, black thing here. Uh, can you read to me, Fabrizio? Because the the first sentence is. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Can you read the whole the whole sentence? Okay, consciousness is like a child that is born daily out of the primordial womb of the unconscious. Cole Jung, uh, CW two, part nine hundred thirty five. Okay, thank you so much. This is um collective works. If anybody wants to check, and this is the paragraph. So you see that um. Uh, the child, the consciousness, like the, a child that is born daily out of the primordial womb of the unconscious. So that's why we always think of a notion, and uh, when we dream of um, oceans and uh, waves, and sometimes people dream with tsunamis <laughs> and not very nice oceans and things like that, especially when they are pressed by you know in a crisis or feeling the pressure of unconscious stuff emerging without the control of the ego for instance many other uh, ways of seeing it depends on the person's dream um is any specific uh, specific uh, dream but i i thought it's very interesting it's in the internet the young sen uh, sentence that uh, it's continuously conscious and being born daily, okay, uh, from the unconscious. So I think this is a very important sentence uh, by Jung. Let me just uh, change here. So Jung says that man never perceives anything fully or comprehends anything completely. So let's be very humble, people. <laughs> when you think, I know, I know this, I know that. Uh, no, we never perceive anything fully or comprehend anything completely. Uh, he can see, hear, touch, and taste. But how far he sees, how well he hears, what his, uh, his touch tells him, and what he tastes, depend upon the number and quality of his senses. So this limit uh, his perception of the world around him. By using scientific instruments, for instance, he can partially compensate, okay? We can use telescopes, for instance, to you know look at the sky, to have a better view. But no matter what instruments he uses, at some point he reaches the edge of certainty beyond which conscious knowledge cannot pass. So you see, we have a limitation of our consciousness. And this is very important because we, the, in our consciousness, the ego, uh, is here living this life with his senses, trying to understand and to adapt in this life. Uh, but of course we have a limitation. Even for instance, we know, I know many people here have pets, for instance. So they can hear, many pets can hear, can um, see uh, different things uh, from us. But for instance, our dogs can hear, can smell much, much better than we do. Uh, I think some weeks ago, I saw a, uh, an image of a dog uh, that was, you know, barking desperately, even putting his paws like this. He was going up to nothing at all. There was nothing there. And he was reacting as um, uh, it was a male dog. So he was it was reacting as. Uh, it was something there threatening uh, the uh, his owners, you know, what was he seeing or it seeing that nobody was seeing. Okay, so uh, even our senses are limited. 
So for Jung, so I'll ask you again to, to read the first sentence, please, Fabricio. Okay. <clears throat> for Jung, there are also unconscious aspects of our perception of reality. Okay. Do you want to read the rest? Mm -hmm. okay. So nice to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. <clears throat> The fact that even when our senses react to real phenomena, they are somehow translated from the realm of reality into the of the mind and become psych events. Number two, there are certain events of which we have not consciously taken note. They have reminded below the threshold of consciousness that is man and his symbols caused of you. Uh, yes, so that was some um, some sentence that I brought to you from uh, from Jung's chapter in Man and His Symbols. So you see, um, when some fact, okay, even when our senses react to real phenomena, uh, we um, are per uh, we perceive them. We are are in contact with these facts. Uh, at the same moment, they are somehow translated from the realms of reality into that of the mind and become psychic events. Okay, so I cannot say, um, I like very much an image, uh, remind me now, um, it came to my mind, an image uh, that I that I uh, listen, it was in, I don't know if I told you that, if sometimes I repeat myself, please Fabrice and everybody else can, oh, and you have already said that, but it's uh, about, for instance, the perception of the truth. What is the truth? And Jung said, it's my truth, okay, that we have to be in contact with our own truth. So um, uh, the, the, the image that I heard I think it was Chico Xavier, that great medium in Brazil, that I was uh, talking to some friends and they were saying, oh, how can we reach the truth? I don't know if I have uh, given you this image, Fabrizio. If I have, you say, uh, you just do like that. But uh, that the truth was like, um, at some point, okay, it's a, it's a very beautiful image, was... Um, a very big a mirror in the sky and something happened that this mirror fell uh, on earth and uh, broke in many pieces so each one of us get one, one small piece of this mirror and look at it but we will only get to see the whole truth the whole mirror when we all get our mirror small piece of mirror look at it and put together in the sky so when we all put the mirror our pieces in the sky make this you know make the mirror whole again then we will get near the truth or some truth at least the truth that we with our uh, collective consciousness can grasp at this point okay so I think this is a very beautiful image and so that we understand that when we are looking to our small piece of the mirror, it's our, uh, it's a psychic event because the psyche is trying to understand itself. It's very hard. It's what we are doing we are, when we are trying to do when we meditate, for instance, to the inner vision that Jung was saying, okay? And he says that also there are certain events of which we have no consciously, even uh, we have not consciously taken note and they have remained below the threshold of consciousness. So there are a lot of stuff uh, in the unconscious. So um, Jung says that everything I know, so what is the personal unconscious, okay? Everything I know, but what I'm not thinking about at the moment, all of which I was once conscious, but have now forgotten, everything perceived by my senses, but not noticed by my conscious mind, 
everything that uh, involuntar involuntarily and without paying attention, I feel, think, remember, want and do all future things, future things that are taking shape in me at some point and at some point we'll reach consciousness. All this is content of the unconscious. This is in the collective uh, works. Um, this is the volume, okay, and the paragraph, okay. So this is, I, th I think it's a very nice, it summons up very well uh, what Jung thought about the personal unconscious. See how big our personal unconscious is, okay. But it's uh, a note that it's always I. I'm not thinking. I was uh, once conscious. I feel, think, and remember. Okay? So that's why it's personal unconscious. And another way of talking about uh, the unconscious, um, in this personal part, in man and his symbols, Jung says... In the unconscious, there is subliminal material, okay, from which the symbols of our dreams may be spontaneously produced. This subliminal material can consist of all urges, impulses, and intentions, all perceptions and intuitions, all rational or irrational thoughts, conclusions, inductions, deductions, and premises, and all varieties of feeling. Any or all of these can take the form of partial, temporary, or constant unconsciousness. Okay? Remember the iceberg. So there are depths. When we are, especially when we are, when we are talking about intuition, but I... Just to give you, okay, we are diving together. We are going under the surface, okay? There are depths. So he said that such material has mostly become unconscious because there is no room for it in the conscious mind. Some of one's thoughts lose their emotional energy, for instance, and become subliminal. They no longer receive so much of our conscious attention because they have come to seem uninteresting, maybe, or irrelevant, or because there is some reason why we wish to push them out of sight. Then our defense mechanism, then some classes coming. Okay, we are going to be talking about that. So you see, there are some uh, some of this material in the unconscious that maybe kind of lose the energy because they are no longer um, interesting, because uh, we lose attention to them, uh, because they have uh, come to seem, okay, relevant, or because um, for some reason we wish to push them out of sight. Okay, so all of this constitutes the personal unconscious and going deeper. We are still going deeper. So it is, in fact, normal and necessary for us to forget in this fashion in order to make room in our conscious minds for new impressions and new ideas. If this did not happen, Everything we experience would remain above the threshold of consciousness and our minds would become impossibly cluttered. Can you imagine that? Um, Jung said that it's nice to joke or to, you know, play because some, someone who doesn't, who loses the ability to play, to joke, um, you know, it's more difficult for, for this kind of, pe of people to have insights. We have to be in contact with, with our creativity. With, uh, we have to have freedom of mind like children, you know. So I always like to think of uh, even cartoons sometimes come to my mind. And um, 
when uh, this when he was talking about this when i was reading again to summon up to you it, uh, when he says if this did not happen everything we experienced would remain above the threshold and our minds would become impossibly cluttered remind me of the disney cartoon i i remember the name uh, in portuguese uh, maybe the people that talk portuguese can put in the chat the in portuguese is divertidamente the cartoon i think won uh, uh, an award or whatever it's about the little girl who um, uh, and uh, and the um, the cartoon starts with the small people inside her head the happy one the depressed one and goes on so if anyone can uh, can remember the name in english please put in the chat it's a lot of fun I don't know, Fabrizio, do you know the name of yeah. the English? Kirst, she just uh, shared with us, it's, it's called Inside Out. Ah, uh, Inside Out. Thanks so much. I asked Anne, I forgot. I asked my my daughter and I forgot. And it was, I think, I don't know if it was yesterday or even tomorrow, you see? And it was not in my conscience anymore. So probably because I was paying such attention to what I was going to tell you that I forgot the name of the movie in English. So that's a good example. But just as conscious contents can vanish into the unconscious, new contents which have never yet been conscious can arise from it. From, um, and Jung gives the, the expressions, for instance, when we say something is in the air, we are having kind of a you know, a feeling that something is in the air, something is coming from our unconscious or to smell a rat, we say in English, smelling a rat, for instance. And he says that the discovery that the unconscious is no mere depository of the past, but is also full of germs of future psychic situations and ideas led me to my own new approach to psychology, okay? Because uh, let's not forget to, to Freud, the unconscious, there was only uh, the personal unconscious and the unconscious was a depository of the past traumas and memories, repressed stuff, okay? So Jung says that when analyzing all the dreams and materials coming from images, coming from... Uh, his patients, he discovered the unconscious, full, also full of germs of future psychic situations and ideas that led, uh, led him to his uh, own new approach to psychology. And he, sa uh, he says that we find this in everyday life where dilemmas are sometimes solved by the most surprising new propos propositions. Many artists, philosophers, and even scientists owe some of their best ideas to inspirations that appear suddenly from the unconscious. And uh, he gives some examples. For instance, Descartes, the, the French philosopher, had a mystical, an anomalous experience that involved a sudden revelation in which he saw the order of all sciences. Let's not forget that we uh, regard, uh, we think of Descartes as um, creating the scientific me um, method, okay? And for instance, the, um, the British uh, writer, Robert Louis Stevenson, had the plot of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, for instance, suddenly revealed to him in a dream. Uh, we are going, this is one of the example when we are going to talk about the shadow, but I don't want to give you all spoilers. Um, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But you see, it was suddenly revealed. He was looking for a plot to explain some of, you know, this duality um, that he saw in all of us and uh, but he couldn't find a plot and this plot was suddenly revealed to him in a dream okay 
So Jung's over, this is John Freeman's uh, in the, the BBC journalist that made face to face. I don't know if we uh, have the movie that it's in the, the YouTube, uh, but I strongly uh, suggest that you all see face to face. It's an interview, John Freeman um, is interviewing Jung. It's a, maybe three years before Jung da, uh, death. And it, uh, it was the beginning of the idea of man and his symbol, that it's the only, only book that Jung wrote thinking of the general uh, population and the, the common people. So Jung's overwhelming contribution to psycho, uh, psychological understanding, according to John Freeman, is his concept of the unconscious, not merely a sort of glory hole of repressed desires, as Freud thought, but a world that is just as much a vital and real part of the life of an individual as the conscious, cogitating world of the ego and infinitely, infinitely wider and richer in Jung's view. The unconscious is the great guide, friend and advisor of the conscious. So to study man's relation to his own unconscious is to study human beings in their spiritual problems. You see why Joanna is uh, uses a lot of Jung's concepts, okay? Because she's trying to wake us up to our spiritual difficulties and to our spiritual growth. And so this is very, it's very important that we understand the unconscious in a wider and richer way, as John Freeman is saying, and understand that it's not a glory hole of repressed desires, okay? Of course, there is repressed material uh, in the unconscious, but um, it's much wider and richer, all the, this, the contents of the unconscious, uh, especially when you think of the unconscious, that would be, as I can tell you, because my in my past life, as I said, Freud and training, uh, I used to, I was taught and, and saw the unconscious as a, as a part of the, of the psych, of the mind that uh, was kind of sick because it had this repressed material in it. And we had to, we had contact with it to get better, healthier. But if we think, okay, that's a part of this story, but if we think of the unconscious as a guide, a friend, and an advisor, well, then the story changes, okay? And so to, as, and that to study man's relations to his own unconscious, that's why it's so important um, that we think together this, the name of this class is, the study group is self-discovery, Okay, so self-discovery means also that we have to understand uh, uh, deeply the richness of our psyche and these different layers and how they communicate to each other, um, you know, among them. And uh, also, also that uh, the relation and everything that it's in the unconscious and stop feeling so afraid, so defensive, of our, of our uh, personal contents in the unconscious, okay? And just to give an example, this John Freeman says in the introduction, uh, he said that when uh, um, he interviewed Jung in Face to Face, and then uh, he came to London, and then the idea, I don't remember the name of the guy, but it was very powerful, I think, in, in editing books, um, some publisher uh, thought, oh, you must do, and this was like two, I think, uh, two or three years before Jung's death. So he was very old and tired. And uh, but they said um, uh, to Freeman to go there and to Zurich again and try to 
ask and to convince Jung to write a, a book for, you know, the regular people. And um, uh, John Freeman did that. And he and Jung said no, very politely, but he said no to John Freeman uh, when, West, when he asked to write the book, okay? For non-specialist adult readers. So, and everybody knew when Jung said no, he would uh, think a lot, but when he said no, it was definite, okay? Um, Jung said he had never tried to popularize his work in the past and he was old and rather tired. But he had it, but then what happened? Then comes the guide, the advisor that we are talking about. Then Jung, uh, sometime later, he had a dream, okay? He dreamed that instead of sitting in his study, and talking to the great doctors and psychiatrists who used to call on him from all over the world, he was standing in a public place and addressing a multitude of people who were listening to him with rapt attention and, quote, understanding what he said. He was very amazed, to, um, you know, with this dream. So Jung was advised by his own unconscious to reconsider an, an inadequate judgment he had made with the conscious part of his mind. That's why it's so important to pay attention. It's a small example, but it's not that small because we have men in his symbols and we can, everybody can read and even it's, uh, you know, for people that doesn't know anything about psychology, but if you go little by little, it's understandable and it opens a lot of doors. So it's very interesting that he, his is the main chapter is, you know, um, it's the, the heart of the book. And um, of course he had, he, you know, three of his very personal friends and analysts uh, who understood him quite well to write together with him. He was old and he was tired. And I think it was very interesting. It's a synchronicity. We will be talking to, about this. In, and of course, we will ask uh, Corbett to talk about synchronicity. He's kind of a specialist um, in synchronicities events and, uh, you know, no, the numinous events. But Jung uh, finished his chapter only 10 days previously to his death. So I think it's, you know, I really think at this point, we could all send, you know, uh, to uh, whenever and uh, whenever Jung, uh, Jung's soul is, a thought of gratitude that he was able to listen to his unconscious and to write this beautiful book and to open the doors uh, of uh, his death psychology to all of us to you know that you know even people that don't have all this uh, knowledge of psychology but can have a you know a deep way of looking to himself and where to start okay so in addition to our immediate consciousness this is always in the uh, it's in the internet to uh, immediate consciousness which is of a truthfully personal nature as we saw this is Jung talking there exists a second psychic system of a collective universal and impersonal nature which is identical in all individuals. So I wanted to bring, Jung has beautiful sentence. It's all over quotes of Jung in the internet, but I wanted to, I always try to bring some so that we can think together uh, what he meant by that, you know? that it's a never ending, I brought, I brought this uh, image that I think it's very important. We can 
think of this symbol later. Uh, there is a, a spiral, right? And that it's um, very uh, interesting to think. Uh, let's go back to that image of the icebergs, each one of us as an iceberg. As um, You know, for me as a Brazilian, I would like a more warm water, <laughs> but I think a lot of people from different parts of the world won't mind jumping in the the cold water so it doesn't matter it's just for for as a metaphor so think of about the icebergs um so of of course if we are thinking of the surface okay so above the the surface there is this in the consciousness but if we think that under the surface of the water there there exists a second psychic system that goes deeper okay okay there is the personal part of it but go, going deeper uh, goes to reaches a point of a collective universal and impersonal nature which is identical in all of us so why do we keep feeling so apart of each other if uh, this part of our own psyche is identical to all of us, you, you see that doesn't matter which culture or whatever way uh, we are, as we were talking about, uh, I think last class, of culture, country, you know, gender, sex, whatever, color of the skin, whatever you want, it doesn't matter at this point deep, there, there is a, a, sec, a second psychic system that it's identical in all of us. We are immersed on it. So it's just the ego and our consciousness that, that feel each other as so different, okay? But that makes no sense in a, in a deeper level. So look at, and this is also, I think it's a beautiful sentence. The collective unconscious, Jung sentence, contains the whole spiritual heritage of mankind's evolution born anew in the brain structure of every individual. So in the top of the wave or the top of the iceberg, the whole of the spiritual heritage of mankind's evolution. Remember last class, the embryos that we saw, the ontology uh, simulates the uh, uh, phylogeny of the species, right? So the whole spiritual heritage of mankind's evolution bo is born anew in the brain structure of every individual. So here at this moment, all of you that are listening to the class, to this class, all that will be listening when they enter in uh, Fabricio's link in, uh, in, in, his, um, in his Spiritist Center, everybody who reached there in the internet, we don't know when, and when uh, you know, if we are going to be alive or not. <laughs> But everybody will have all the experience that we are having here at this exact moment. I think this is so wonderful. I, maybe I'm not, of course, maybe no, I'm not conscious of what is going on in your, each of your, uh, you know, the student's mind. But doesn't matter because we are having an experience. Maybe some of you are making connections. Maybe some of you are you know, reaching to some memories or thinking of something, something in the future, even from the future that was there, you know, coming, wanting to come to the surface uh, is coming to the surface. Doesn't matter. Everything we uh, are going to be, you know, sharing together. Where? in the collective unconscious, in the transpersonal dimension. I think this is beautiful. So we call the depths of the soul that uh, between 1909 and 1912, Jung developed the notion of the archetypes 
and begin exploring the impersonal layers of the unconscious, arriving at the concept of the collective unconscious, okay? Some images that are all there. So to Jung, in addition to our consciousness at the personal unconscious and the personal unconscious, which is of an absolutely personal nature, the top of the iceberg of the wave of each one of us, there is a second psychic system of a collective, universal, and impersonal nature, which is identical in all individuals, as we saw. This collective unconscious does not develop individually, but is inherited. It consists of pre-existence pre forms, the archetypes, which only secondarily become conscious and which give definite forms to certain psychic contents, contents. We are going to see all of that in some other class, okay? But it's just to give an idea. So in the collective unconscious, so we have the, the consciousness, the personal unconscious right uh, under the surface of the water and going deeper that we cannot measure, we have this uh, second psychic system of uh, that Jung called the collective unconscious, okay? Uh, that does not develop in individually, but it's inherited and consists of pre-existent forms, of course, because it's our heritage, okay? Spiritual heritage and psychic, spiritual and psychic heritage. So the archetypes, these pre-existent forms, ancient forms, which only sec uh, secondarily become conscious and which give definite forms to certain psychic content contents. So the individual psych is not just a product of personal experience. It also involves the transpersonal dimension. It's another way to call the collective unconscious which manifests itself in universal patterns and images such as can be found in all mythologies and religions of the world. Because, for instance, all uh, mythologies and religions talk about, for instance, the myth of creation. Maybe some different myths of creation, but all of them have myth of creation. So this is an archetype how uh, life was created, how we were created, okay? So this is common to all cultures and religions and mythologies of the world, for instance, okay? So in the book, The Integral Human Being by Joana de Angelis, so she talks about man facing consciousness in chapter eight. So in according to her, the most important moment in human beings evolutionary process happened when we acquired consciousness to discern good from evil, truth from imposture, right from wrong, continuing on, on the upward march that one day will lead us to angelitude. Okay, because she's talking now about our spirit our higher self, okay? So look what she said, the most important moment in human beings evolutionary process happened when we acquired consciousness to discern good from evil, for instance, truth from imposter. So let's not get stuck in social medias or reading this or that. We have to connect again with our own truth and uh, this process of discernment, okay? We cannot say, oh, but this person said that, that person said, it doesn't matter. It's, um, it's individual and it's collective, but we can only reach the collective, remember the iceberg, the collective unconscious or something of the collective unconscious can emerge to consciousness from the consciousness, right? So we have a consciousness, we have an ego doing the job, a very tough job of trying to reach this uh, depths, okay? 
so that we can evolve together, individually and together. So let's not get stuck in, you know, something uh, you know, crazy outside, the crisis, this and that. Okay, we are suffering, the ego suffers, but it's a personal responsibility to find within ourselves, our, our own discernment of good and evil, truth and impossible, so we can help right or wrong, we can help also the collective. When Joanna talks about the birth of consciousness, she says that anthropologically and historically, the balanced survival of human beings and society has always been linked to the idea of a central myth. Remember Jung talking about his personal myth, uh, from which the ethical values that sustain their activities and their balance are inspired. Okay, and just remember that myths are narratives of a symbolic, a symbolic and imagery nature that evolve with the historical and ethnic conditions related to a given culture and that seek to explain the origin of things, okay? But it's not given culture, but remember, okay, we are all in the same ocean. So even if we have different myths, for instance, from different cultures, going deeper in the transpersonal dimension, we all, you know, have the same uh, the same spiritual and psychic heritage. So for instance, okay, I'm Brazilian and I have some, some personal images, uh, for instance, but I have already dreamed with um, images that I had never seen before not even in museums around the world or something like that, uh, and had no idea. I will tell you later when we talk about dreams, okay? But this is later on. I will uh, tell you one or two of my own dreams. But, and I had no idea of that image where uh, it was coming from. And Jung kept uh, having a lot of patience and people telling him, I have no idea where this image is coming from. Now you all know that it's coming from the person, uh, the collective unconscious. Okay, so I just wanted to give us some time. Then going to the end of the explanation. So, uh, and that every time that adverse factors, this is Joanna talking, interfere with human needs, discrediting the one who synthesizes their aspirations, uh, human beings head towards chaos and attacked and disturbed each other, seeming to have lost their way. Isn't that something that we can connect? I think this book is more than 10 years uh, when Devaldo wrote, channeled uh, Juan in this book. So, and it's very, very, you know, actual. I mean, very now nowadays, very to this time. So for Joanna, after the storm, its undestroyed remnants emerge giving rise to a new ideation and a creative myth appears, filling the gap left by the previous one. So every time we have a crisis, it's also an opportunity of growth and of expanding consciousness. Because of this that Joanna is saying, so the remnants emerge giving rise to a new ideation. We say revelation is con constant in the psyche, okay? And a creative myth appears filling the gap left by the previous one. For Jung, myths with their symbolic construction would have the role of mediating the relationship between conscious life and the unconscious. In this mediation, a connection in, is established with the archaic memory of humanity, the archetypes. In this sense, for myths to fulfill their purpose, they have to be experienced, lived, okay? Cannot be a myth that somebody else is telling me about in their own culture, but I haven't lived, I haven't 
had a, a personal experience of it. Um, so for Joanna, in the current state of society, there is a lack of a predominant myth which unites all minds, pouring its blessings on them and comforting them. We are kind of lost nowadays. The loss of the myth exposes the psychic contents, is, that's Joanna uh, saying, which alter the objectives, all, uh, objectives of their needs, making them plunge into emptiness or disinterest, into pleasure or into hallucination of power. Isn't that very to our days? Considering that none of these goals fulfills the individual, he starts to dispute the comprehensive need for awakening consciousness, interpreting the minor myths lying the rain. Okay, so he will focus on the minor myths, but not, and then you get kind of lost, but not in focus in, okay, what's going on, what's happening here, and what was destroyed in a sense and what is um, asking to be born again in the psyche. So Joanna recalls that Jung established that existence is only real when it is conscious for someone. And then man's task is to become aware of the contents that press upwards coming from the unconscious. It's our task, people. So in this, uh, Joanna goes on, in this dynamic movement, the emergent contents form consciousness as well as its current contributions of consciousness will be incorporated into the unconscious. It's a dynamic moving, movement up and down. So the birth of consciousness for uh, Joanna takes place then through the conjunction of opposites. See how important it is not to get dissociate. Oh, this is that, and I'm this, and I don't believe that, and I'm, it's totally the opposite. The opposite of things, we are in a duo, spirit and matter, in a duo uh, dimension in terms of consciousness, okay, of the ego. So we had the birth of consciousness and the, also the expansion of consciousness takes place then through the conjunction of opposites. From there, according to Joanna, arise the discernments between opposite things, the me and the not me, the ego and the unconscious, the subject and the, ob and the object, the person and the other. See how important it is? For instance, in the myths of creation, we always have... Um, the the we need the discernment of um, the me and the not me um the the group of people you know and the creator for instance oh, uh, the the knowledge the spirit or the the um, intelligence that created uh those people for instance in different cultures okay so we always have these opposites, uh, the good and evil in many stories and, and so on. So without this duality of opposites, which leads to reflection for Joanna, in the process of the psych's evolution, there is no real increase in consciousness, which only operates by coming into contact, contact with opposites and absorbing them. In the central myths of all peoples, for instance, she says, the opposites form the essence of their beliefs, of their psychic contents that generate uh, consciousness. And uh, I brought to you some thoughts of Joseph Kampner, the great mythologist. And he says in the Hero with a Thousand Faces from 1948, uh, that one thing, that appears in myths uh, is that from the bottom of the abyss comes the voice of salvation. Let's have hope. The dark moment is the moment when the real message of transformation will arrive. 
In the darkest moment comes light. Another duality, okay? So for Campbell, the transcendent is unknowable and unknown. The mystery of life is beyond any human conception. We always think in terms of opposites. Mythology suggests that behind this duality, there is a singularity over which it plays like a shadow game. Okay, so let's think again of the iceberg of the wave. Uh, I like very much, Lionel is not here, but he calls the head office, the transcendent. So, uh, so okay, it's like a singularity, okay? And uh, since we are in this duality, for instance, the conscious and the unconscious, right? Um, we have the difficulty uh, to grasp it. So mythology comes uh, and suggests that behind this duality, there is a singularity over which it plays like a shadow game. So we can have an idea, we can have insights, uh, but we cannot understand totally and grasp it. So the contribution of the spiritist psychological vision that Joanna brings in her words, recalls that the atavistic legacies, which become archetypes in the individual and the collective unconscious. This is totally Joanna. Jung never said that. Atavistic legacies, which become archetypes in the individual and collective unconscious, concern the realities of the spirit. This is totally Joanna itself responsible for the psychic residues, which transform into the preponderant contents for the formation of conscious. So Joanna is saying that the formation of our conscience uh, depend on the psychic residues, okay? That concern the realities of the spirit. And the spirit is responsible for this residues, which transform into the preponderant contents of uh, for the formation of conscience. We are going to be talking more about that when we are uh, study the self, but I don't want to give spoilers. We're going little by little, okay? So Joanna thinks that human beings must acquire knowledge to rise above the brute being, becoming the holders of consciousness. It will not be enough for us to know, but we also need to live the experience of being the known object. Makes us very humble and uh, help us to think of the search for truth, for meaning, that is spirituality. So according to Joanna, a healthy life results from conscious freedom capable of facing the obstacles and difficulties that arise in human relationships and in indi individuality itself. This is the goal that consciousness seeks. This is why we are here, people, right? To have conscious, uh, a, a freedom of conscious and to be capable of facing the obstacles and difficulties that arise in human relationships and in individuality itself. Why? Because according to Joanna, the human being who discovers himself, what we are trying to do here in the group, becomes indulgent and his actions become actions of benevolence, beneficence, love. His intimate space expands and reaches others, which he houses in the area of his interest, modifying the co uh, coexistence and psychological structure of his social group for the better. Don't we need to pay attention to uh, Joanna's, uh, you know, beautiful sentences and beautiful um, knowledge that she's bringing to us. This image of our spirit 
being able to expand consciousness, uh, living this life, living this experience, uh, being able uh, to helping each other, you know, with our consciousness to go deeper within ourselves and to become this better person, to become indulgent in our actions, to uh, to become benevolent, um, you know, to become beneficent, to love people better, and so that we can really make what Jung tells us to do from next last class, that until we make the conscious and um, the unconscious conscious, it will direct our life and it will and we will call it fate. So we don't we, we have we need freedom and we need uh, you know, as Joanna says, to expand our consciousness, but the work um, begins within ourselves. So I'm sorry, but it's it's very complex and a lot of material to talk about. I was trying to, you know, make smaller, but I think I don't know if we want to stop with the recording and we can have some time to I think we have some minutes to answers and comment. Okay. Thank you, Anai. I will um stop the recording and then you can move on to the questions and answers.